and I, I would not have known that it was the wrong one. I'm not tech savvy at all. This would have been, that one would have been just fine. And so, overcoming fear with faith. Fearless, to be fearless, what is that? Understand that fearless, it is, it is not the absence of fear, but it's being empowered by a much stronger faith that actually propels you to do it anyway. It propels you to do it anyway. Understand that the woman you see is not the woman I have always known. Okay, bring up the baby picture. Bring her up, bring up the, this little, little, this is little, little Jessica here, or they, my family just called me Jesse. okay? So this is, this is Jessie. I have always been, according to my mama, she would say that I was, you know, shy, a little quiet, uh, probably a little bit socially awkward. Um, I am naturally introverted, naturally, so I would probably, you know, if I was just coming and showing up here, I would probably be at the back table and be smiling the whole time and praising the Lord and just asking Holy Spirit to just shield me in the Holy Spirit bubble. Um, <laughs> Because that is just naturally who I am. But my mom would say, she would say, you know, oh, you, you got up and, you know, you, you would make these noises, these little weird noises. And I, I later learned that what they are, they are stirbs. What is a stirb? A stirb is a short-term energy-releasing behavior. And the funny thing is I still do that. Like, I literally still make noise, especially, especially when I am nervous and uh, really intimidating and fearful. In fact, when I came up and they took us to, you know, uh, the green room, the holding room, and immediately when I sat down, I, I started making noise. And my assistant, she was like, uh-oh. And, uh, and, and I was like, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And I was like, let me be quiet, Jessica. You don't want to be embarrassing. There's other people in here. It's a little weird. <laughs> As you want to know what kind of, And so, yeah, I do stuff like, I think I, it just like, I, and it just, I, I can't help it. It just comes out. And I knew that I was going to say that, and I, but I couldn't believe that it automatically came out at the table. And I was like, girl, shut up. You're going to embarrass yourself. <laughs> and, so, and so either I'll make a noise again because I, I deal, deal with fear too. I deal with intimidation too. And so I may make a noise or then sometimes when I'm about to preach, a melody comes into my head. And some of y'all may think it's melodies from heaven, but it's not. It's not a melody from heaven. Uh, anybody know who a Bone Crusher is? Um, and so I kind of just do my, and then I'm like, dum, dum, dum. I told him, told him, I ain't never scared. Like, I'm from the 20s, y'all. I'm from, from the hood, okay? So, <laughs> so bone pressure, like, comes, it comes in my mind. Some of y'all feel, y'all feel me. Okay, y'all got it. So, so that's just kind of who I am. And, <laughs> but fast forward from, from little Jesse, uh, I didn't grow up in church at all. <laughs> I never saw a Bible in my house or anything like that. And uh, I never, you know, never heard my mom pray or my, my grandma, n nobody, my auntie, n nobody. And I know, is that unbelievable? No, it's really true. Um, and so I was totally fine with, I mean, you know, I, we were heathens and it was fine and everybody was okay <laughs> with it. And, um... But at, at 17 years old, at, as a senior in high school, my mom moved us from 24th Street. She moved us from 21st Street. Actually, we lived in Hilltop. I lived in Hilltop for about four or five years. I don't know what it's called now, but if you know anything about Hilltop, yeah, I know a little bit about being a rider, okay? So, so I'm just I'm just telling y'all who I am, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> so, so moved us from Hilltop to the suburbs. I was, you know, I was a senior in high school by that time, and I was like, this is a total culture shock. Like, oh my goodness, like this is horrible. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But there was a young lady in my class. She invited me to church. And she, I mean, she was prophetic. She saw that I needed Jesus. And, um... <laughs> 
And so she, she invited me to church. And I went one time and I never left. And so at 17 years old, I gave my life to the Lord. The Lord, Lord totally wrecked my life. And about a year later, I was engaged. About six months later, I was married. Okay, yeah, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, can we put the Can we put the next picture up? That is my only wedding photo that was taken on a Blues Clues camera. I, I couldn't make this up if I tried. Okay. Literally the only wedding photo, we were in our work clothes. Both of us worked at uh, the daycare at the church, okay? And so you imagine, I, I was 18, he was 20 on daycare salary. Um, yeah, <laughs> Jesus is right. Keep saying his name because I needed him. So um, that was the only, only, wedding, only wedding photo we had. Um, and so we got married. Six weeks later, on a Monday, I started having a miscarriage. Um, I was three months pregnant, so y'all do the math. Okay, yes, I, 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 was, I was pregnant uh, when we got married. Six weeks later, on a Monday, I started having a miscarriage. That Friday, uh, my mother and father-in-law, who had married us, they were also our pastors. They were killed in a plane crash. So I thought that, oh, God, you've saved me. you changed my life. This is going to be great. You brought me into this wonderful family. I'd never seen marriage before. I'd never seen godly people before. I mean, I was amazed. I thought everybody was weird and awkward and, well, why are you guys hugging me and all the things. Um, but then all of a sudden I felt all that was snatched away from me. And so... That was, I mean, that, that was a moment, that, that period in our lives was so painful. And not only was it painful, but it was absolutely terrifying. Because a year later, next picture, my husband became ordained. Don't ask what we had on, I don't know, okay? Don't, don't ask. Um, but that was the ordination day. And, you know, I was crying, I'm a crier. Uh, and I was crying, and people probably assumed that it was the joy of the Lord, and I was, that I was so grateful and so amazed, and oh my God, I married the pastor's son, and this is awesome. Again, I don't come from church, so I didn't care whose son he was. Um, and <laughs> so, so I, I didn't even plan on sharing this, but so much so, I actually called my husband a ninja, a ninja, take out the, yeah, uh, in front of my late father-in-law. He they was like, oh, honey, we got to pray because she, 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 you know where I came from. So, so the ordination service, I was boohooing, and it wasn't because I was happy. It wasn't because I was joy-filled or any of that. I was terrified. I was absolutely petrified. I said, God, you knew, you know where I came from. You know I don't know nothing. I didn't even know. By that time, I probably knew two scriptures. But when I got saved, I did not know one, not even John 3, 16. And I said, Lord, what are you doing? What have you done? It's like you threw me out in the ocean knowing good and well I cannot swim. And so, again, the me you see is not the me I've always known. And so we're talking about overcoming fear with faith. Understand that, like I said, I was, I was afraid. I was fearful. And so without fear, though, we do foolish things. Without fear, we do some. I, I mean, listen, again. I know my life before the Lord, and I did not fear him. I did not reverence him. And without fear and reverence, honey, I've done some, some, foolish, some foolish stuff. However, without faith, we would never step out into the unknown. And some people would tell you that fear is the opposite of faith. But I would say that actually fear is the result of having wrong faith. 
What do I mean? Well, we all have faith. We all have faith. You have faith in the chair that you're sitting on. You have, you have a trust and a belief that that chair is not going to give out from up under you. You had faith to driving your car that your car was going to make it to this place. You have faith in your job. Maybe some of us have faith in our children. I just call kids little sinners, okay? Because uh, I tell my kids after that, I don't trust you. you a sinner. Uh, so you... We have faith in all kinds of things. Yes, I am not that parent. No. Did they? Yes, I know that one. I know that one. They definitely did it. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. We all believe something. You, you believe something. But the thing about it is that your faith is it's only worth the value of what it's attached to. And so if I simply just believe in my job or if I simply believe in my accolades or if I simply believe in my career, understand that my faith then, it is only worth the value of what it's attached to, which is why we need to have faith in God. Oh, y'all praise the Lord. Y'all, y'all did it. I sent y'all all them black slides and y'all did so wonderful because I was up here concerned like, oh my God. I said, all those black slides, you guys are amazing. Thank y'all so much. Um, so I was nervous with a B. Okay, I saw them, your slides, and I was like, oh, my God. I sent all those black slides. But God bless y'all. Y'all so wonderful. Okay. I feel so great now. I don't have to worry about it. I was going to tell y'all don't be distracted. So, uh, so. So, but what I do want you to do, again, because this is a women's empowerment. This is a workshop, right? And so you're going to you put in some work. And so as you see the slides and things coming up, I want you all to take notes. I want you to get your phone out, take pictures of the screen, because you're going to need these scriptures and things for when you leave, because we expect you to do some work, right? You got to walk this thing out. And so you're going to need it, right? And so the thing about fear is that fear, it really presents us with a great opportunity. Fear presents us with a great opportunity because it exposes the measure of our faith. And so this is literally one of the most common tactics to get you and I to lean on our own understanding. That's fear, right? We know the scripture says that, you know, we are not to lean on to our own understanding, but we, we're, right, we are to acknowledge God's and God in all of our ways. But fear, it attempts to get us to lean on our own understanding. And we have to understand that and, and know that we are being led by fear, um, when we, we draw the conclusion that what could happen to me will cause me more harm than if I waited on God. And so when we have these anxious thoughts, this fear, we are driven by fear when we draw the conclusion that what could happen to me because of whatever situation, right, will cause me more harm than if I wait on God. And so therefore, I'm going to take things into my own hands. But I found out a while ago as I was walking with the Lord and as I was literally having to trust God with everything, being so new, not knowing anything, right? All of these things I had to, as I felt like I was flailing in the ocean, drowning, I found out this, what Abigail Dodds wrote, and I, I love how she says it. She says, a life of obedience to God is the riskiest kind of life that has ever been truly safe. It's the riskiest kind of life that has ever been truly safe. And so as we walk through this, guys, we're gonna, we are going to learn how to overcome fear with faith by trusting the God of our assignment, trusting the God in people, and trusting the God in ourselves. And I know, it's like, wait a minute, you just said people. People, people trash. Yeah, I know sometimes they are. But it's okay. So here's the thing, and I know, a lot, like, you know, even for myself, it's like, well, what about this that happened to me? And, you know, maybe some of us feel like we have a right to be afraid. We have a right to be intimidated. We have a right to be anxious. You know what they did. You know what I went through. God, you allowed this to happen to me. But what I want you to know about biblical faith is that biblical faith is not about escaping reality, right? We live in a very real world, but it's about facing reality with a hope 
right, with a hope that anchors us and that propels us towards a better future. And so here we go. Trust the God of your assignment. Trust the God of your assignment. You're going to see, um, you're going to see those scriptures. So take a picture because you're going to need them. Trust the God of your assignment. What do I mean? Uh, well, understand that our ultimate purpose is to bring God glory, right? The scripture tells us that we have all been made to bring him glory glory. That is our ultimate purpose. However, like our sister said here, he has assigned each and every one of us a specific way to walk that thing out, right? Um, but you guys know something about God. Maybe if you don't know, you're going to find out today. Um, he doesn't just give us any old assignment, right? He don't just be like, here, your job is to, you know, let's say if you're a gardener, and, you know, it's like, I know how to garden, God. I got this, you know. <laughs> just like, go ahead, just keep watering the plants, you know, or me. God, I'm, I, listen, I know how to be from the hood. Like, I know how to do that, God, real, very well. You know, and, and God's like, nope, I'm calling you out of that. And so God doesn't just give us any old assignment, but what God does, he gives us a God-sized assignment that literally stretches us and causes us to have to step out and walk in faith. This thing, I understand that our God-sized assignments, they are often intimidating. They're often frustrating. They're often, God, why did you call me to this? Can you, and we, like Moses, we bring to God all of our stuff. I can't speak. God, I stutter. God, you know, I make weird, stupid noises that causes me embarrassment. Like, God, you know, you know, God, I, I didn't know one scripture. God, you called me to do all of these things. And the Lord is like, yes, yeah, yes, in fact, I did. Because, again, it's not about you. Right? And so God gives us these God-sized assignments that we have to walk out in whatever place that he's placed us in, whether it's an assignment to preach, whether it's an assignment to work uh, where you're working, whether it's an assignment to run a business, where it's an assignment to move to that city, that state, that country, right? God has given you a God-sized assignment. And I know many of us, maybe some of us have heard like, hey, if you believe that you can do it, it's probably too small, Right? But if you believe that you need God's help, then you're probably walking in faith. Yes, yes. And I love 1 Chronicles 28 and 20. Uh, this is David. He said to his son Solomon and as he was going to build the temple in 1 Chronicles 28 and 20. He says, be strong and courageous. And what? And do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He won't leave you or abandon you until all the work for the service of the Lord's house is finished. Do the work, right? Do the work. And some of us know what working is, right? Many of us have been working probably since we was two. You know, if you're anything like me, my mom was a single mom. There's five of us. I was the second to the oldest. So, baby, I know about some work, okay? I was little, so I was mama number two in so many ways. But doing work outside of God is a different thing than doing, doing work with God. And so David is calling his son Solomon. He's like, look, look, Solomon, I know this is a big thing. I know this is a God-sized assignment. I know that you're probably intimidated and fearful, and then you got to lead all these people. Anybody know about leading people? They're beautiful, made in the image of God. Yes, they are. And so... And so it's a God-sized assignment. That, tell me, I know you're intimidated by it, but this is what he says. He says he won't leave you or abandon you until what? All of the work for the service of the Lord's house is finished. Why is that important? Because understand whatever assignment God gives us is for the service of the Lord's house. It is ultimately to build up his kingdom. 1 Corinthians 3 and 9 talks about how we are God's co-workers. We are his field. We are his building. And then according to verse 10, he says we all must be careful on the foundation of Christ that we build on. We all must be careful how we build on it. And so, God, if we are yours, if we're your workers, if we are your building, if this is your field and we are all working for one purpose, one, you know, one vision and 
in unity that I have to be careful that I'm not allowing fear to order my footsteps, but faith. And oftentimes, we, again, we look at ourselves and we're like, oh, my God. Like, God, I can't do it. God, I don't have enough resources. God, I don't know about these people. God, I'm, I'm intimidated. We look at our situation. But let me encourage you. Don't dismiss what you know about God in fear of what you know about your situation. And I'm sure many of us have been there like, oh, my God, look at this. Look at this situation. And we allow the situation to lead us and not our faith in God. And so fear says, you know, fear, fear says, here's the promise. But if you want to see it come to pass, you need to be your own provision. That's what fear says. Like, oh, okay, yeah, got it. You, okay, God called you to do that. Okay, well, you better figure it out. You better work it out. You know ain't nobody, you know, can't count on nobody but you. You know you're the only one that can do it. You know you gifted. You know you talented. You know you can, it ain't going to get done right unless you, you know. And fear tells you all of these things. Like if you want to, you know, you know what God said, but if you want it to come to pass, you're going to have to, you're going to have to come up with a provision for it yourself. You're going to have to make it happen. And I think that's really important for all of, uh, all of the islands out there. What is the islands? What is the island? The I, 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 I got to do it. I got to make it happen. I got to, you know, have it all figured out. I got to figure I got to fix it. I don't have time. Ain't nobody, I'll, you know, maybe. And I've heard us say this, especially women, you know. Anybody with any super women got your cape on? I hope you took them off when you, when you came in the room. I hope you, took, I, I hope you took, took the capes off when you came in the room. You know, we, we do that. We, I, 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 I got to figure it out. I got to make it happen. And it really, it creates us and puts us on, on an island. And so that's why this next thing is, is important. Trust the God in people. If you want to overcome fear with faith, you have to trust the God in people. What does that mean? Understand, again, because I didn't grow up in church, because all of this was so new to me, I realized that not only was I introverted, but I realized that I was afraid of people. Like, you know, they would make the phone calls. You got to, you know, we had some mentors, like, call people, see how they doing. And I'm like, I'm not calling nobody. I'm not calling. No, I will not. See, so you want me to sit down and dial a number? Brrr, and up. No, I'm not calling nobody. When they come in, make sure you give them a hug. I'm not giving nobody a hug. I'm not giving a hug. I'm not. Smile. No, this is my resting face. And this is what you're going to get because this is me. Yeah, it's funny. My, my husband would be like, he would ask my kids, do mama's, do mama's face. And I mean, it's just a real stoic type of face. That's just my resting face. And I will often have my resting face on. But I hope ain't you no know, ushers with resting face because that's not going to work. Uh, uh, so you have to trust God in people. And I had to learn to trust God in people. I had to learn how 1 Corinthians 13 tells us what love is, right? And part of love, part of the God type of love is believing the best in people. Oh, and that's so hard. I know it's so hard because people be acting a fool. And now, I mean, we get to see it all over the, the internet streets, right? We get to see all of the foolery, right? I mean, it's like they're unashamed about posting them doing the fool. And, but, Lady J, you are telling me that I need to trust the God in people. Yes. How, how do we do that? Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 it says, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. And so in order to trust, we, we have to trust the God in people because the scripture says that we have to consider one another. How many of us, oh, oh gosh, how many of us are inconsiderate? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't raise your hand. Inconsiderate people, ooh, it's kind of get under my, gets under my skin a little bit. But consider one another, why? To provoke love and good works. I need you, you need me. 
if you want to walk out your God-sized assignment, we need each other to stir it up in one another. God's like, hey, girl, you going to stir her up? You stir her up, girl? You gonna... And y'all know how we do. Oh, girl, you cute, girl. You going to kill it today. Oh, God's going to show up real big. And y'all like, oh, you, of course they called you. Of course you the one. Stir it however you do it. Maybe that's not what you do. Maybe that's not what you do. That's what I do, okay? But to provoke love in one another, how I treat you, how I see you, it provokes love, right? It should provoke good works. I like how the TPT version says it. It says, so now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps his promises. Discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. That ain't y'all because y'all here. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. And I get it. I get it. I get it. It can be hard, right? Trusting the God in people, especially when we know the ugly in people, right? Like everything ain't godly. And, there, and it, we all got a sick man, you know? We all, we all got a sick man. Maybe my sick man may be 24th Street, and your sick man may be something else, you know? But we all have, right, the flesh that dwelleth within us, right? The good that I want to do, I don't do. I be tripping sometimes. That's just my, my version. Um, but I, I get it. But here's the thing. Some of the ways that we respond to people in the present is actually based off the seeds of distrust or mistrust that were planted in us from people from our past. And so you wonder why you don't trust nobody. You wonder why you always side on. You wonder why, what they going to say, what they showed up, how they going to do it. You wonder why. Because those seeds were planted in you from your past. How so? How how so? And I know <laughs> how. And and this is something that we often don't talk about, but in the, the field of, of psychology, you know, they talk about how that bond and that trust is built from the mother. From 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 the mother. And so oftentimes when those seeds of distrust have been planted in us, it has often come from our mother. How, how, how? Uh, perhaps maybe they didn't affirm you. Perhaps that maybe she provided uh, materially, but she did not provide emotionally. Perhaps when you needed her, she wasn't there. Perhaps, you know, um, even, of course, being abandoned by, by fathers. Like all of those things build this. And it, so in us, we say, I, I can't trust people. Why? Because I've had to figure it out on my own. I have had to figure out my emotional health on my own. I have to meet my, you know, different needs myself, the needs that I should have gotten from a mother, a parent. And so those seeds that have been planted in us, then we see the harvest in the relationships in our present. And so it makes it hard for us to actually trust people. And so we're questioning them. We're wondering. We're, we're pondering. Are you really who you say you are? Right? Because this person that was supposed to be nurturing and caring and all that was not. And so it's easy for me to not trust you because they should have been. But we have to learn how to trust the God in people. And this is what I found out, again, coming from knowing nothing, absolutely nothing. Coming from knowing nothing, I found out that the fullness of who God created you to be won't be discovered nor developed outside of community. Again, I thank City of Truth all the time because they loved me, they graced me, they poured into me, they gave me them holy handshakes, they dropped off diapers and wipes and all kinds of groceries, somebody. <laughs> they did all of that. They, they allowed me to fumble my way through uh, trying to 
interpret scriptures and preach to them and all kinds of stuff. And so who I am today would not have been developed or discovered outside of community. You need people. You need people. And I get it. And some of us are afraid not just to trust people, but some of us deal with people pleasing. So we are afraid of what they may say. We're afraid of what they may think. We're afraid of, you know, what they think about how we look. We, we are so afraid. But Psalms 56 and uh, 3 through 4 says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. And God, whose word I praise, right? So I don't praise the words of other people. Yes, uh, people encouraging you and leaving comments on your social media. So all of that, it, it feels great. It feels great to, to everybody. But in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. Then I love this part. What can mere mortals do to me? Say, what say who? Again? Because Bone Crusher is often my theme song. I ain't never scurred. Or if you're from St. Louis, you say scurred. I mean, it's fearless. This is what this is about. I'm, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of what you're going to say. I'm not afraid of what you might do. I'm not afraid of any false accusations. Number one, because I don't need to defend myself because God is my defender, right? I don't have to be afraid to let you in. I don't have to be afraid to invite you over. I don't have to be afraid to be hospitable to you. I don't have to be afraid to be kind to you. Why? Because my fear is in the Lord. I mean, so much so, I really believe in this thing called fearless. I mean, I even got a tattooed on my arm, Psalm 27 and 1. Yes, you guys, I, I told y'all where, like, y'all, I told y'all where I'm from. Like, I... I don't believe tattoos are a sin. That's a whole nother session. That's a whole nother session. But I got it tatted on my arm. Fearless, afraid of nothing and no one. Psalms 27 and 1. That's the TPT version, all right? So trust, trust God. So after we trust the God of our assignments, we trust the God in people, and then we trust the God in ourselves. And I find... <laughs> Now, listen, I, I didn't say trust yourself. I didn't say trust yourself. I did not. Let me be clear. Let me be clear so y'all can hear me right. I did not say trust yourself. I said trust the God in yourself. That's the difference, right? Because the, the scripture tells us to put no confidence in our flesh. Because everybody knows, the Bible says, right, the flesh is weak, baby. This flesh is weak. Without Jesus, I know some, the stuff that I did without Jesus, okay? I know the, the, the fun that I had without Jesus. It's not fun anymore. But I know. I know me without Jesus. And I be trying to tell my husband and my kids, y'all, y'all want to see her. My middle name is Shantae. Yours too? <laughs> you got that E with the hyphen on the end? Oh, girl. I'm just saying. S-H-A-U-N-T-E with the hyphen. Shantae need to, she, she need to stay. She need to stay up under the subjection of the Holy Spirit. So, so I, did, I said, I said, trust the God in yourself. John 14. 16 and 17, this is the words of Jesus. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, or the Holy Spirit, right, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But as believers, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be what? In you. And so that's the difference, that I can trust the God in myself because God is literally in me. And I think one of the greatest threats that the kingdom of darkness, that it, he uses against people of God is fear. It is fear, it, it, and it's not just right fear, fear of circumstances because he does that, not just fear of, of other people because he does that, not just fear of our call and our assignments because he does that, but especially in today's world. And, I mean, we even see it then. He, he intimidates us with the fear of ourselves. 
And it wasn't long ago when I got that revelation for myself as I was thinking about this next uh, part of my assignment and what God has called me to do and God, you want me to go out and God, you want me to say and God, you want to put stuff out there and God, you want my introverted self to to make videos and all this stuff like, oh my God. And then then you start questioning yourself. Oh my God, what are my motives? Oh my God, what? God, I don't want pride to rise up. Oh my God, what? But what if, God, is this me or is this you? God, do I want to be seen? Do I want to be like what? And you start asking yourself all of these things. Why? Because you're intimidated by you. It's nobody out there, but it's the intimidation by you. And so, what do you do when you are intimidated by you? It's not what they say, but it's what I say about me. It's not what they're saying, but it's what I believe about me. And so the enemy will have us literally standing in our place, not moving, not rocking the boat, not stepping outside the boat, not walking on the water, not operating in the assignment and the gifts and the calling that God has placed on our life because I'm too afraid of me. God, I don't want to mess it up. God, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Any perfectionists out there? Especially us number ones. If you know anything about the Enneagram and our, our number ones, oh, my God, I'm a, I'm a one to the heart. It's right or it's wrong. And so I really have to fight through the gray areas most times. You want to do the right thing. You want to say the right thing. You don't want to mess up. But that is, for, it's a root of fear. And we're intimidated by our own selves. But I love how, I love how, how, you know, the Bible talks up to us all the time, and he tells us, right, the Holy Spirit is our counselor. He's, he's our helper. He's within us, right? And so, so what do you do when you fear yourself? Well, when you fear yourself, you trust the Holy Spirit's help. Yeah. And so I had to realize, I had to realize, okay, now, if I can believe the good in other people, if I can encourage people, if I can believe the best about people, then why can I not, I not believe that about me? It's, then you have to look at your track record. Okay, well, have you been thus far? Maybe you've had some fumbles. Maybe you had some falls. But thus far, have I been following God? Have I been listening to the voice of God? Have I been going with what the word is saying? Have You know, is, has my walk been, you know, walking with, with the Father in faith? Have I been doing this thus far? Yes, okay, that's a check mark, okay. And then you, then you have to really search yourself and say, okay, if I can trust and, and believe, you know, the best about people, if I, I, my track record says I've been walking with, with the Lord, then why can I not believe that about me? Knowing that God, if this is not you, you'll steer me the right way, right? Holy Spirit, you're in me. You're my helper. You're my counselor. If you're not telling me to do that, if you're not telling me to say that, if you're not telling me to go that way, then I believe because you've been leading me thus far, you'll get me back on track. And that is the type of faith that we as women, that we as children of God have to walk in. That, you know, I'm thinking about Abraham and I'm thinking about how God called him out from amongst his family right? And he said, listen, I just need you to walk, Abram. I need you to walk. I need you to leave this place and I need you to walk. He didn't give him, okay, now step one is going to be this. Step two is going to be this. Step three is going to be that. He said, walk and then when you get there, I'm going to tell you. And that is what God does to each and every one of us. I'm thinking about the women in the Bible. Women like Deborah. Honey, if you don't know nothing about Deborah, I need you to read the book of Judges. Understand that Deborah was the only female judge. Deborah was a prophet. Deborah was a judge. And not only Deborah, Deborah was never scared. How do we know Deborah was never, never scared? Y'all must... <laughs> Deborah was never scared because Barak, the army leader, the man who God says, listen, Barak, I need you to go out here and fight these people. And Barak was like, okay, I'm going to go, but I need Deborah to go with me. And Deborah was like, let's go. What's up? Nuck if you buck. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Wrong room. Sorry. 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 Uh, and that was Deborah. She walked in. She walked in. Thank you for joining us today. You may have heard us talk about giving your life to Christ or receiving salvation. I wanted to take a moment to speak with you a little bit more about what that means. I believe the big question is, why? Why would I give my life to Christ? The first thing that's really important to understand is as human beings, we've all done something wrong. 
whether that's lying or cheating or stealing, and the list goes on. No one is perfect. God calls those things sin. The second thing we have to understand is that sin, the bad things that we've done, separates us from God. It drives a wedge between us and God. It's like when we have a serious disagreement with a friend or, and we feel that distance, that, that gap or that space emotionally in our relationship. It's similar to that. Our sin caused distance between us and God. And that sin, those wrong things that we've done, they just can't be swept under the rug or ignored by God. They separate us from Him. The third thing is that God loves us and doesn't want us to be separated from Him. He hates that. So He gave us a way to reconnect with Him. He sent His one and only Son, Jesus, from heaven down to earth to live a sinless life and to show us how we can live a life in relationship with God again. But He didn't stop there. He willingly sacrificed his life to erase all of our sins. So we don't have to fear sin causing that separation or, or that wedge anymore. Nothing can prevent us from having a relationship with God again. Nothing will ever separate us from his love. The fourth thing that's important to understand is that it's up to you to give your life to God, to believe and accept that God loves us. He sent his son to die for us and he wants to forgive us for our sins that we've committed. God wants us to have a choice. If you force someone to love you, is that really love? Of course not. God wants us to respond to him genuinely out of the understanding of his love for us and the lengths he's taken to restore our relationship with him. God walks us through how to give our life to him in the Bible in Romans 10, 9 through 10. It says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. That's all we have to do to accept what God has done for us and restore that relationship with Him. Confess and believe. I know that may sound simple or even cliche, but I promise you it really is just that simple. Wherever you are today, at home, in your car, at the gym, at school, you can talk to God and tell Him, I'm sorry for the sins I've committed. I believe you sent your son to die for my sins, and I accept you in my life as my Lord. When you do that, you're making a decision. When you say that out loud and you choose to believe, you're giving your life to God, and that is the best decision you will ever make. If you have given your life to God today, please let us know. We wanna give you some resources to help you on this new and exciting journey on your life and help you grow. Please visit our website, ecinternational.org, select Next Steps, then select New Believer, or scan the QR code on the screen and select I've Accepted Christ. God bless you. See you next time.